So I'm going to read chapter 1, verses 1 to 4, and then we're going to fl- flick over to chapter 4. Um, but I'll tell you that. In a so Luke 1, uh, verses 1 to 4. Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those, um, uh, the, by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. With this in mind, since I myself had carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I too decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may have knowledge of the certainty of the things you have been taught. So then we're flicking over to chapter 4 on page 1031, starting at verse 14, so the top of that page. Uh, Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread through the whole countryside. He was teaching in the synagogues, and everyone praised him. He went to Nazareth, uh, where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. He began by saying to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips. Isn't this Joseph's son, they asked. Jesus said to them, Surely you will quote this proverb to me, Physician, heal yourself, and you will tell me, Do hear in your hometown what we have heard that you did in Capernaum. Truly I tell you, he continued, No prophet is accepted in his hometown. I assure you that there were many widows in Israel in Elijah's time, when the sky was shut for three and a half years, and there was a severe famine throughout the land. Yet Elijah was not sent to any of them, but to a widow in Zarephath, in the region of Sidon. And there were many in Israel with leprosy in the time of Elisha, uh, the prophet, and yet not one of them was cleansed, only Naam the Syrian. Right, we, we, um, we're heading to Luke's Gospel. This, this term um, is going to be something a little bit different. Um, I've, I've sort of given the title for this term, Encountering Jesus, and... Um, The hope across the term is that we're going to be looking at about 13 or 14 different sort of encounters that Jesus has. Um, In the main, it will be with individuals. Now and then it will be with a couple of people. Um, And today we're actually starting off with a a group, a synagogue full of people. Um, And because we're going to be sort of dotting about in Luke's gospel, um, I thought one of the things that would be really, really helpful this term is um, if we could actually read Luke's gospel um, as a church, sort of alongside our growth groups and, and Sunday mornings. So I thought I'd pl- please, please Rishi Sunak could do a bit of maths. Um, we're going to be going for approximately uh, 12 weeks, slightly more, but makes the numbers easier. Um, so 12 weeks, and there are 24 chapters in Luke. So how many chapters per week have we got to read? So a couple of two chapters a week to read um, as we move through. And basically, we will then at the end of it, have read the whole of Luke's Gospel, and where we're dipping into these encounters that Jesus has with people, you'll sort of see where they fit in with everything else that's go- going around. So, um, yeah, I'd love you to, to get on board with that if you can. I don't think it's a vast amount uh, for us to do on top of other things, two chapters. Uh, might be that you just read it once, uh, maybe that you want to divide it into seven little chunks or something and do a little bit each, each day of the week. Uh, to cover the couple of chapters. Um, maybe that you've got time to read two chapters, the same two chapters each day. So read Luke 1 and 2 uh, tomorrow and the next day and the next day. And really get the gospel into our um, sort of being, really. But we, we're going to be sort of dropping in, as I say, um, as we go on these individual encounters. Um, and my hope, I think, for this series is that as we um, observe Jesus in these encounters and, and watch him, and sort of listen to what he says and see how he goes about things, that we will actually get to know him better and that that will then transfer, as it were, into our walk with him. So we'll get to know him um, more clearly, uh, more deeply, and that that will impact us um, and our walk. Um, I think, I don't know whether you're somebody that ever watches any kind of reality TV, um, 
we're, we're, we're in a series at the moment. I'm not going to tell you which, which one. Um, but the more you watch and the more you see sort of characters being, the more you see them interacting and responding to situations, in a sense, the more you begin to get a sense of the person, of how they tick, of how they respond. You can almost begin to predict what they're going to say or how they're going to be. And I think, again, that's the hope that this term, these next three months, that as we just watch Jesus meeting this person, meeting these two people, dealing with that person who's come with that need or that issue, that we'll watch him see him and, and, and basically get to know him better. Um, so that, that's the sort of hope um, as we go through this series. And as I say, this first one in, in Luke uh, chapter 4 is um, with a crowd of people. Uh, Jesus is back to Nazareth. Um, we're told in verse 16, this is where he'd been brought up. Uh, this is where he was a, a, a sort of a lad and spent uh, a number of years. And he comes to the synagogue in Nazareth, we're told in verses 16 to 21. If you just want to have a little bit of a glance down there, that it was the Sabbath day. Jesus went to the synagogue, as was his custom, and he stood up in the synagogue to read. Um, he was going to read from the prophet Isaiah. The scroll was handed to him. And uh, Jesus unrolled it and found a particular place and then read those verses, which I'll read in a minute, verses 18 and 19. And he then rolls the scroll up again and sits down and they look to him and uh, he begins to teach them. I don't know if you've ever done any kind of presentation or anything at at school. Do you still still get asked to come out the front and do do stuff? I I know sort of now and then it happens at sort of junior schools and maybe in some subjects in secondary school. And maybe you've done some sort of presentation and then people are talking about it afterwards. Maybe you've done that at work. I've been in that sort of situation where you've talked to a team or presented on something. Um, I don't know if you've ever been in a situation where you've had a really bad response. Um, Hopefully not. I mean, it must be awful, you know, to just have people either talking very much amongst themselves um, or maybe even coming and confronting you at the end of it or or sort of um, grabbing you, taking to one side at the end. Um, must be an awful thing. I imagine being at Word Alive doing a seminar and having a couple of hundred people and people sort of coming up quite cross at the end. Um, when Jesus has read from this scroll of Isaiah and sits down and says a few words about it, at the end, the synagogue is furious with him. Um, absolutely furious. I, I sat there, I even fooled, fooled myself. My memory's getting so bad. I thought, why is Susan stopping there in the reading? And then I remember that's why I'd I'd asked her to stop there. (laughs) Honestly, it's not looking good, is it? Um, Verse 28, all the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard this. They got up, drove him out of the town, took him to the brow of a hill on which the town was built in order to throw him off the cliff. (laughs) So that's a presentation that hasn't gone down too well, isn't it, with, with the crowd? That's a huge reaction. I want, with these encounters, the things I'm beginning to love about them as I think about them is just how easily we're sort of transported into that moment. Could you imagine? I mean, it's probably easier today than, than on some of the other passages we're going to see. In that synagogue, sort of sat there as Jesus comes out and reads from the scroll of Isaiah, comes and sits down and begins to speak. And by the end, they literally want to kill him. Now, why this reaction? That's the sort of question, really, as we then delve into a little bit of the middle part of of this passage and and this sort of encounter. Why this reaction? And I think there's a couple of things um, that, again, we just need a little bit of help, I think, to see why the size of the reaction. The first thing that we notice in the verses that Jesus um, reads is there in verses 18 and 19, and, and it's what he says there is the first part of what begins the chain reaction within the listeners. Um, now, I don't know whether you're, so, you're one for sort of inspirational quotes. Um, I know sometimes there are things people have said or things that have been written or may even be something from a film or something that's particularly grabbed you and, and stuck with you. Um, maybe the sort of thing that you write in your diary or have something flash up on your phone to remind you of certain things, some, some quote that you want to to live by or to shape you. Um, Often when people go into positions of leadership, they'll quote quotes from other well-known and and leaders that have done well or whatever in the past, and I want to take that as something I want to do or whatever. 
Now, Jesus here in verses 18 and 19 reads some words from the past, uh, the prophet Isaiah, and and they say this, verse 18, the spirit of the Lord is on me. This is what the the prophet Isaiah wrote uh, seven, eight hundred years or so before um, Jesus was born. The spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. And Jesus has been given the scroll and and gone through and found this place to read to them. And the context of Isaiah 61, uh, many chapters looking at the state of God's people, um, their relationship with God, they're harassed, they're helpless. Uh, It speaks of the waywardness of God's people, uh, what they've got up to, the way they've drifted from God, the needs that they have. And it's very clear in Isaiah 61 that they need rescue. And God in those chapters is going to act, he's going to move to save his people. He's going to bring judgment upon his enemies, but he's going to save his people. And as Isaiah sort of builds up to this point in Isaiah 61, all of this is going to happen through an anointed, an individual anointed by God, equipped by God to come as the rescuer of his people. And as you get to the the end of the Old Testament, the hope of the people of God is the coming of this figure. Everything is is dependent upon him. Everything is in him. All of the fulfilment of God's promises, right from the beginning to Abraham and David and others, are all wrapped up in the coming of this anointed figure. God sent God anointed figure. And so when Jesus, just glance down at it, at verse 21 begins his talk, so we think he probably said a bit more than this, but he began by saying to them, today, this scripture, these words of Isaiah, is fulfilled in your hearing. In other words, the sort of magnitude of what Jesus is saying here, having read Isaiah and pointed to this coming figure, that it will change the world. The end of Isaiah will speak about a new heavens and a new earth, the doing away of all that is sinful, all that is wrong, justice of God coming, righteousness being given to his people. Everything will be fulfilled, says Jesus, through this figure. And essentially he's saying, I am he. Now, the one thing that particularly in the first half of this passage that struck me and got me sort of thinking is, to what extent have we actually domesticated Jesus or somehow shrunk him? To what extent have we minimised him from who he is? Some of you won't know this, but the email reply that you get sometimes comes later than I'd initially intended it. Because on, a, on the afternoon of a day, you are filling my computer screen and then as my mind goes elsewhere, I hit the minimise button and you shrink back to the bottom of the screen here and you're a little tab at the bottom. And then I've got to make the dinner for Karen coming home and all of those things, get the cup of tea on and so the computer goes off and the next day I come on, all the screens come back up and I look down there and I hit the button and suddenly you come back again. I think, oh no. I'm late with my reply yet again. But sort of just shrunk down and parked at the bottom of the screen. To what extent, and I think there's so much of this question in this passage, as we will see, to what extent have even we minimised Jesus down, shrunk him down, domesticated him from who he actually is? Now, this thought comes from verse 22, where after Jesus has finished speaking, what do the crowd say? But they say, isn't this Joseph's son? Isn't this the carpenter's boy? He knew knew our kids, used to play about in the street when they were younger. Is that him? Claiming to be the one that Isaiah spoke of claiming to be the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed king, the one who will bring in a new heavens and a new earth, who will deal with human sin and death and rebellion and bring righteousness to all who put their trust in him. Isn't this Joseph's boy, minimise? 
It's interesting. I don't know about you. I, 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 I think maybe it's because I'm nosy, but the do, documentaries are always interesting to me. The, the going behind the scene of people, you know, that are, uh, are sort of in, known for their brilliance, you know, on the stage or in music or on the football pitch or wherever it might be. Uh, Louis Theroux, recent series, went to see Judy Dench, Catherine Ryan, Stormzy, Youngblood, um, and two others who I couldn't remember. And he goes and he sees them in doing their thing. He sees them on the stage. He sees them with thousands in the crowd. Um, he sees them, you know, with hundreds there at the comedy show. But then he goes home with them and he meets their mum and their dad or their children or their brothers or sisters or those that they went to school with. It's sort of really interesting to sort of take the person off the stage, away from the thousands, and just put them in amongst people that just knew, have known them forever. And you pick up this sense with brothers, sisters, schoolmates, parents or whatever, that yes, they know they're good. At, they know that their son or their brother or whoever their friend is good at what they do, but they knew them when they were little. They knew them when they used to go over the park. They, used to, they, they knew them when they did that and the other with them. The crowd in the synagogue, their response to Jesus, we're told, is that they're amazed at his words but their response is, isn't this Joseph's son? We actually know who he really is. And Jesus' comment in the next verse, verse 20 or verse 23, tells us something about what he sees in their hearts. Isn't this Joseph's son? They ask. Jesus then says to them, surely you will quote this proverb to me. Physician, heal yourself. And you will tell me, do here in your hometown what we've heard you did in Capernaum. In other words, Jesus sort of showing them that what's in their hearts is a real resistance to him and actually a hostility. Heal yourself, physician. It did remind me, literally, as I was just working, walking down to church this morning, of, a, of an encounter I had with the GP. So Susan and Nicola can close their ears at this point. It was quite comical. Um, it was one of those where they thought you should have a bit of an MOT, we haven't seen you for ages, and I, can you guess what they thought needed to change with me after Mike's book review? I'll just stand here for a minute. <laughs> the funny thing was, looking at this GP was a little bit like looking in a mirror. So it was so funny, it was very lovely, he said you really do need to lose some weight, and then said but don't we all, you know, and we had a bit of a laugh, but he said look you do. Um, Heal yourself, Jesus says, is what's in their hearts. Take a good look at yourself, Jesus. What are you saying? Physician, heal yourself. And then Jesus says that what's in their hearts is, well, where's the proof? Show us. Show us the marks that you're the Messiah. Show us your, the, the marks that you're the Christ. You're the anointed one. You're the great promised figure. The things that we've heard you've done down the road, let's see them. So their heart attitude, as much as they say, we're amazed at your teaching, and as much as it may be slightly veiled, isn't this Joseph's son? Sitting behind that sort of perhaps more acceptable exterior is actually a heart of real resistance and real hostility. Now, I sort of started to think, you know, and we do this with all these encounters. We want to enter into the encounter. We want not, not only in the main to see Jesus, but we will see something of ourselves in these encounters as well. So where is this landing for us? That was the question to, to ponder this week. What's the synagogue equivalent? They would go along, wouldn't they, regularly to a building have the Bible read out loud and somebody say something about the Bible, they'd probably sing some songs and say some prayers. This encounter is a little bit uncomfortable actually I think for us this morning because there are certain similarities aren't there with us um, and them. Some of them would have been there, I guess, because it was culturally what they did. Some may have been there because that's what their family did and they had to do what their family did.
The heart attitude that Jesus addresses here that we need to think about is that sense of we're okay with Jesus. But there's a sense of, I don't know, this, this far, but no more. An acknowledgement, perhaps, that he's the one coming to do the reading. He's the one coming to speak. Maybe teaching good things. But there's a resistance inside. There's, a, there's actually a hostility if we were pushed. It may be the sort of acknowledgement for some that, you know, he, he's right up there with the religious leaders. We would certainly see him as a way to God. We would see him as being somehow deserving or right for, for part of ourselves, but not all. We'll stick with much of what he taught. But when we look closely at what he says about marriage or sex or money or contentment or sacrificial living or forgiving others that have wronged us or, 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 or that's beyond the line. Now, Jesus delivers ample evidence in the chapters to come that he's the Messiah. Um, Luke's gospel is full of it. In fact, as soon as he's left these people, we begin to see the signs that he is the Messiah. But this encounter warns us of where that sort of resistance or hostility to Jesus can actually leave us. In verse 24, Jesus goes further with the heart diagnosis, where he says, Truly I tell you, no prophet is accepted in his hometown. In other words, their resistance and hostility, essentially, they would not accept him. Again, they may speak well of him initially, perhaps, in that first verse about their, his gracious words and comments about it like that, but essentially, they would not accept him. And I want to say something now that may be a little bit hard, perhaps, for some to swallow, maybe. If we accept 75% of Jesus, we are not accepting him. If we accept 95% about Jesus and what he, what he taught and had to say, we are not accepting him. There is a resistance, there is a hostility. The Jesus, if we come down from 100%, the Jesus that we think we know is a Jesus of our own creation. It's, it's not the full Jesus, the real Jesus. As a result, in this passage, in terms of these people here in the synagogue in, in Nazareth, firstly, they will not see the signs performed by the Messiah. Jesus will not perform those signs for them. And the second thing that follows in this passage is that God's grace will go to others. That's the sort of warning that's here for those in Nazareth, that their heart attitude means that he will not show them the signs of the Messiah. When they say, prove it, he won't. But actually, others will receive God's grace and God's gifts. And Jesus actually makes that clear in something that may initially seem a bit unclear to us in verses 25 to 27. So Jesus says, no prophet is accepted in his hometown. I assure you that there were many widows in Israel in Elijah's time when the sky was shut up for three and a half years and there was a severe famine throughout the land. Yet Elijah was not sent to any of them, but to a widow in Zarephath in the region of Sidon. And there were many in Israel with leprosy in the time of Elisha the prophet, yet not one of them was cleansed, only Nahum, Nahum and the Syrian. In other words, Jesus is saying, look back into the history. In the days of Elijah and Elisha the prophets, when Israel had turned away from the Lord, they turned to other gods, they'd left God and his good and righteous ways of living, and God's judgment came, the famine came, the sky was shut up, they were under the judgment of God, in line with the covenant agreement they'd made with, with God, 
the blessing of God was withheld from the people and his blessing actually went to others, to a widow outside of Israel and even to a Syrian commander. God's blessing and grace went to them. So his blessing was held back and his blessing went to others. And this is the warning of this encounter. So those who are familiar with Jesus or familiar with God here in this, this synagogue in Nazareth, to some who in a sense knew him, Joseph's son, they were familiar with him. They were familiar with the things of God. And yet their refusal to accept him meant that God's blessing would be held back from them. They would not see that he was the Messiah. They would not see the signs performed. And the blessing of God would go elsewhere. We'll see throughout the book of Luke, actually, that the religious repeatedly miss who Jesus is. And the good news of who he is, his grace, his forgiveness, everything he's come to, to bring goes to everybody and to the most unexpected of people. And we'll see many of those encounters uh, as we go along. Can I just say, just want to say, I think, a couple of things in terms of right, rounding this up. Can I say for us to think very, very seriously this morning in terms of this parallel or, or, or um, comparison with them? Do you know, God sending Jesus to the people of Nazareth is an act of his mercy. God has sent the one that Isaiah spoke about in verses 18 and 19, the one who his spirit would be upon, the one that God had anointed, the one that was, God was sending into the world to do these things. He sent them to these wayward people in Nazareth. But their hearts stayed hard and hardened when he was in their presence. And I just think... We, we've such a, a sort of a, a, an experience, haven't we, in this country, in Red Bull, us right now. You know, God, every week to us, is at the moment extending his arms, isn't he, to, to every one of us. He's saying, this is my son, this is my son, every week. Whether it's in your youth group, uh, on a Friday, or a toast before service, or in the service here, or for in our growth groups, or Sunday services, whatever. God, the you know, everlasting living God, has stepped into every one of our lives all the time saying, this is my son, this is my son. He's my anointed king. He can set the captive free. He can give you freedom. He can bring you into the kingdom. It's a real, you know, sign of the love and mercy of God to these people in Nazareth and to us and to you that he continually says come to me and can I just finish with this one more thing about about our hearts because you you could look couldn't you at this passage and say you know has Jesus read a bit too much has Jesus gone a bit overboard here all they've said is isn't this Joseph's son you know has Jesus sort of read too much into that? Has he gone too hard at them uh, for, for that comment? Well, again, I think Jesus' heart diagnosis is, is pretty much shown to be spot on in, in verse 28, that when they heard all this, they were furious. They got up, they drove him out of the town, up onto the cliff edge and looked to, to throw him over. So the hostility of their hearts that Jesus saw in that comment, you know, isn't this Joseph's son, was borne out to be absolutely right. And the same is true, and this is, I think, the amazing thing of this passage, that, you know, naturally speaking, aside from, from us knowing God, our hearts are a mess. They really are a mess. I mean, we don't have to sort of think back, do we, too much in terms of how we've lived. I mean, even probably into the last week, uh, or so, you know, for, for many different ages here, but how have we treated perhaps our parents? How have we treated our siblings? What do our words, the words of this week, what do they say about the condition of our heart? Uh, what have we given our time to, perhaps on social media? What's our internet history tell us about our hearts? How have we treated those that are less than kind to us? What have we longed for? You know, I mean, you just go on and on and on to see the state of, of our hearts and the language that is in this passage is that we are in bondage 
We are literally in bondage to sin. We are slaves of sin. We have a master called sin. Our sinful nature sort of plays the tune and we dance along. We know all of this is true. You know this is true. I know this is true because we, if we need to, we try to cover our sin. We try to cover what we've done or what we think or what we said. Often think microscopes are the scariest things in the world, aren't they? When you look in a Petri dish and in science, you think it looks like there's nothing there. Then you look through the, the sort of lens down and you see these, all these little creatures crawling around. It's like, ah, it's horrifying. After, I was thinking, that's horrible now, it's a bit of an aside. I was thinking, you know, no, no, don't go there. Don't go there. <laughs> and you see things re- as they really are, close up, close up. It's, bits, it's frightening, really. And the amazing thing I want to finish with verses 18 and 19 is that we think we see something of our heart condition, but Jesus actually sees all of it. I think one of God's, I don't know, is it a blessing that we can't fully know just how wayward our hearts are? But God knows, God sees it, everything. And yet, verse 18, Jesus could say, the spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. And we haven't got time now. Uh, You might be pleased to know, but you, you trace through these references to the poor in the Old Testament. And there's a there's often a dual thing you'll find. There is sometimes a financial sort of poverty and the the physical effects that we would know of that poverty would bring. But in the Old Testament, time and time again, it's either used with or interchangeably with spiritual poverty. So these words can be read in terms of freedom for literal physical prisoners, given sight to the literally blind, the setting free of the actually oppressed and in captive and captivity and so on. There's a physical side, but it's absolutely interwoven with the spiritual side that every one of us who has this heart issue is basically enslaved. We're prisoners of sin. We're prisoners in the realm of sin and death. We're captives of sin. Sin is our master. We're oppressed by sin. We're abused by sin. We're controlled by sin. And Jesus is saying in these verses, 18 and 19, the Lord has sent me to set the prisoner free, to free the oppressed. I've come, he says, to take away your sin. I've come to pay the price for it. I've come to set you free from the captivity and the mastery of sin, the slavery of sin. I've come to win you for, a, for another master, the one who created you and loves you and fashioned your body and your mind and loves you enough to send his son into the world for you. I've come to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour, that year of jubilee, the, the cancelling of debts, the returning of property, the, the sort of just release. And so God says that again to us, doesn't he, this morning from this passage. I see your heart, I see your sin, and I've sent my anointed king for you. So I want to ask you as we finish this morning, will you accept him? Will you give your life to him? Will you trust him? Will you give everything to him? Will you accept 100% of the real Jesus? Not with hostility, not with um, resistance. Or will you say, isn't this Joseph's boy? And minimise him again. It's funny sometimes when you're preparing things, there's things that sort of linger on you and things that are sort of almost like a bit of a weight, that, that need, almost a compulsion that needs to be said. And so I will finish by saying what I feel I have to say. Let me read the words that I've written down here. That I think there are some here today that need to take this step. There are people here today that have hit the minimise button on Jesus too many times. And maybe it's the sort of pattern to go to, to just hit the minimise button and turn the computer off. And I just sort of 
sense as we've been preparing and thinking about this this week, that the, the, the Lord says to, to some here this morning that that needs to stop now. And I've come for you. I've died for you. I've been raised for you. And I call you to come and follow me. And don't make the mistake of these Nazareth synagogue goers where Jesus would not perform the signs and would take his grace elsewhere. I'm just going to leave a moment of, of quiet just for us to, to think, um, perhaps to pray ourselves, and then we'll sing to close.